What do you think is going to happen when you ask for your vengeance? They will die a horrible death, and they will be damned. You don't think I had anything to do with it, do you? It was teenagers playing with the occult. Damning teenagers. You could ask for so much more. You know, personal things, transformations. I'll do it my way. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 141, kicking off Coloween yeah. for all you Coloweenies. The best time of the year is here once again. So... You get to kick off the season for us. What did you choose? I chose one of my more recent spooky favorites, and that is A Dark Song from 2016, written and directed by Liam Gavin and starring Catherine Walker and Steve Oram. It's about a woman who has rented an isolated house in the Welsh countryside and has enlisted the services of a damaged occultist to help her perform a dangerous series of rites to contact her deceased son beyond the veil. And I'm doubly pleased to choose it because it's a debut feature, and I really love a first feature that comes out of the gate establishing an artist to watch for, such a distinct voice already developing. And I know that he started here working within one genre, but one of my favorite things about this is that it's clear from a dark song that he can handle a chamber piece, a character study, a moody thriller. This has small elements of all kinds of films built into it, and he handles all of those elements incredibly well. Well, I'm doubly excited about this because it was my first viewing, and I didn't quite know what to expect, and it absolutely blew me away. And I've got a fun fact for you. Okay. Did you know that Liam Gavin wrote the first draft of the script in about nine days? I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me because I think he's had all of this stuff building up in him for a long time. I kind of liken it to that thing that Elvis Costello says about your first record. You have 21 years or so to build up all of this material for your first record, and then you have about six months to come up with the material for your second. And then he spent about a year making it perfect, and I think you can see all of that work on screen. You absolutely can, and I think the reason that this is also a standout for me is because contemporary horror films in general often don't resonate as much with me. Too much style over substance. I'm not sure what it is, but they just don't click with me a lot of the time, especially examples that I'm supposed to, quote unquote, love. Things like It Follows. I liked it. It was all right, but it certainly didn't live up to all the hype for me. The same with me with that film. I think it's sometimes a matter of a story that I've seen before done better, and this one is unlike anything else you've seen. Do you think that's a fair representation? I definitely think so, and we will get into why. And I want to say that one segment of the horror audience in particular, if you haven't seen it out there, is probably not going to enjoy this. The people that are just looking for fun. This isn't fun that way. And a number of the things that I'm really enjoying lately are like that. They belong to this subgenre of smart, melancholy, mournful horror movies that have loss at the center. Not roller coaster shocks that might wear off as quickly as they came, but real horror. That dead, dull horror of inescapable grief and complicity. What a thrill ride. <laughs> I believe I asked you if it was going to be debilitating, and I think you said yes. But you didn't find it that way ultimately, right? No, I think I was in the right framework for it, and I probably built myself up to be steely against it. And so it wasn't any sort of a slog. Well, let's get right to it. It starts in a way that I love. It begins with an epigraph, which I love the old school touch of. There's a long tradition of the epigraph as horror device to set the tone for a story, 
and it's probably on my mind a lot right now because I am reading Edgar Allan Poe's short stories on the Patreon all month, and he used epigraphs a ton. It feels cozy, it reminds me of my favorite dark tales. An epigraph really helps me settle into the right frame of mind. It's a callback. It's hearkening to something older and darker. And I think the other thing that makes me feel that way right at the beginning here is the landscape. There's a cold-looking storm rolling in over these Welsh hills and valleys, and it perfectly, we realize, matches Sophia's internal landscape and the way that she comes across. Cold, forbidding, turmoil on the horizon. Now, I know this actress, and this performance was a complete surprise because I had previously seen Catherine Walker in Northanger Abbey from 2007, and she is basically the lovelorn sister, the perfect woman, and so this is such a departure. The other element that put me in the mood for what I was going to watch was the music right away. That's Ray Harmon. This low strings that he's using, it's incredible. Well, when we meet her, she's looking to rent a house, and she clearly has a dark motive behind everything, and she is willing to pay for privacy and security. If you've got cash, you know that nothing good is going to be coming from the endeavor. More than anything, it conveys very clearly that whatever is about to happen is obviously very important to her. With the house secured, she has her first meeting with the occultist that will guide her through the ritual that she has rented this house for. And it would seem that he's not her first choice, nor does he look like he should be. What were your first impressions of him? It was a little bit of a surprise to me as well, because I thought, I'm not supposed to feel warmly towards him. Everything is apart. Everything is different. Everything is aggressive and rude. For what reason, I don't know. And I've seen other films that Steve Oram has been in. I didn't realize that he comes from a comedy background. So again, a huge departure and another revelatory performance. But you don't expect to just suddenly see a bloke, as Steve Oram calls him, in this situation. Yeah, exactly. I love the way that immediately this veers away from the traditional course in terms of the way magic is typically treated in films. He's very off-putting. There is nothing at all about him that equates to cool, sexy wizard, quote unquote, in any way. It's not what you usually get in the movies like this. And it's one of the things that appeals to me most. It is exactly what you said just a moment ago. I've never really seen anything quite like this. And that's hard to do with me in horror films. If you think about something like Poltergeist, for example, I think that that sets the stage for how we usually see these kinds of characters. Spirit guides, essentially, are women. And with the parapsychologist, you get the sense, oh, I'm in good hands here. They're generally older as well. Another example of something we watched and loved recently, Terrified. You've got those three older people. And if I were in this position that Catherine Walker's in, that Sophia is in, I would think, I want someone with experience. And to me, that suggests age and wisdom which Solomon does not project. Yeah, he projects a lot of the opposite. And one of the things that makes him so unsympathetic, I think, is that he is so antagonistic to her from the very first moment. He exhibits multiple controlling behaviors. Immediately, can you get a fix on why? Is this a test? Does he have specific mistrust for her? Is he bringing baggage from a previous experience? I think he's become a bully over time. Maybe he was always that way, but I really don't think so. I think this is a cumulative sort of behavior. I think it's his defense that he's built up over years, and now he just wants to get away from everything. And I think his insides are eating him alive. His bullying, if that's what this is, has to be a reaction to bullying he received. When you look like this guy and you clearly spent your teens digging into various grimoire, then you are a target. How do you read it? As metaphor for an abusive relationship, first of all. But the thing is about this particular relationship and what they are trying to achieve, this is a two-way street. For what they are attempting to achieve, faith is key. Faith in the ritual, faith in each other. His flaws have to figure into the mix, obviously, when you think about the things that he abuses, alcohol, 
trust later on. The biggest question mark it gives me right away for something so important, is he reliable? And when I think about his catalog of weaknesses, is this who I want guiding me? When we see his hands shake the first time, it is so startling. And in another movie, this would be the sign that he is the one who is about to bring hell down upon them because of his weakness or his transgression. He's the weak link of the whole thing? Yeah. I think guide that they use is a good term here. It's clearly established she's the one who has to follow all the rules. So my false assumption would be that he also has a part to play, but that it turns out to be not quite the same one as such a clever arc to build into the story. Speaking of things that are built into it, early on here, I love the fact that he asks her if she's Protestant or Catholic. This being an Irish movie, there's baggage in that that might not be what we first think of as American audiences. There's also baggage in offering it as a binary choice, basically. It's a false dichotomy for me that pushes the Judeo-Christian influence into the foreground when there are infinite other options that go unmentioned. I'm assuming based on where they start and him quizzing her on who she's come to see before him, that there's some understanding already that they're definitely talking about a religious practice of some kind and that she has put stock in whatever this idea is or she wouldn't be moving forward. So then an atheist wouldn't be coming to him. Right. And we will talk a lot about that in terms of the way I approach this being a non-believer, but I have that more towards the end of the discussion. Right here, this quizzing that he's doing I like that you bring that up because it continues to reveal a lot of things. He asks, most importantly, about her motivation. And initially, she says that it's for love, which makes him refuse to participate outright. He says, you don't need me, which is kind of true. Unlike, say, The Prince's Bride, when true <laughs> love was the greatest of all pursuits, not here. Right. But he misunderstands the type of love that she means partly because she's being duplicitous about it. But he does continue with this misogyny he refers to her as one of those little posh girls, and he bails. And they head to the station for him to just leave. And that's when she comes clean a little more, and she admits that it's about contacting her dead son. So clearly, quickly, we are dealing with this huge issue of what are you willing to sacrifice to achieve the thing that you want more than anything? To achieve that, it shouldn't be easy, right? Presumably, no. Just at the most surface level, it requires things that are difficult enough for us regular, everyday people anytime. Diet, abstention, chastity, multiple avenues of purification that you have to go through. And even if you succeed at all of those things that are required, there's still the potential that this won't work. So again, the gigantic leap of faith that you talked about earlier. And I think that bullying, the way he suffered in his life prior to now, it rears its head a little bit here. I think it's interesting. He scoffs at the idea of her consulting these other internet occultists. This isn't your mall witchcraft. Magic in the movies is usually very easy and they accomplish it in a montage similar to what you would see when people were shopping or working out. Why do we accept thinking about that now so readily that presentation? Do we just want everything to be easy? Yes, we do. <laughs> I'll take you out of that. The rest of us want everything to be easy, and we all want it set to a soundtrack by the Smiths. Well, you take something that's at the opposite end of the entertainment spectrum, like Marvel's Doctor Strange, for instance. You have Benedict Cumberbatch becoming the Sorcerer Supreme in about four minutes. Now, you compare that to the strenuous, repetitive rites that we see Sophia endure here, it's not easy peasy demon squeezy. <laughs> we see every bit of the requisite blood, sweat, tears, and other fluids. Yes, you're speaking literally about all of those fluids. Yeah, those things that it takes to achieve the desired ends. Now, one of the most appealing things about this to me is that it is definitely folk horror in the truest sense for me. That may be my favorite subgenre of all, and I think this certainly fits under that broad umbrella. 
You had the city dweller that takes up at a rural retreat, taking on more ancient forces that they don't quite grasp the power of. Once this starts, there's no stopping. And then you have all the hallmarks of magic that are of a more elemental, natural, and even hearth-bound variety. Local flora is prominent in these rites. The toadstool here is a classic symbol, cleaning you out, opening you up. A circle of salt seals the house. Do you read it the same way? Is this a good example of folk horror for you, too? I think so, absolutely. Is it just that the UK has a lockdown on folk horror? They just do it so much better than everybody else? It's where it comes from. You expect to just look out the window and see a druid stone just everywhere. Yeah. When I think of Stonehenge, I don't think Oklahoma City. Good point. But this circle of salt that seals the house, it can't be broken for anything. And then a moment comes later that makes it clear that he genuinely believes this and fears that possibility. This is not just a tool to manipulate her. Well, I think maybe both things are actually (laughs) happening, if that's possible. And I think it is. He definitely expresses that bad things will happen if we don't follow the ritual to the letter, if we don't have pure motives. But his dual motive that you're talking about, I feel it, you feel it, she feels it. The first night in the house, she puts a chair up against the door. Where is the gravest danger to her here? In what ways does this feel unsafe to you? From the very first moment. (laughs) The sheer start of the thing, putting your singular hope and desire into a shitty stranger's hands is dangerous and unsafe. He could do absolutely anything to her in this remote house. And I do believe the idea of we cannot break this circle. That is terrifying. Absolutely anything could take place. Having no way out is terrifying. And also summoning demons seems pretty unsafe to me as well. Well, aside from the obvious, the thing that I feel is most dangerous when I'm thinking about this whole thing are the aborted attempts interrupting the flow of what's happening, compromising the effort. It's already off to a bad start, and I feel like it has to be done perfectly, lest you open the door to all manner of evil. So then maybe that's how I read the situation, that I think the danger is coming from him. Going back to that metaphor of the abusive relationship. 50-50, maybe. Or at least we feel that later. In the beginning, yes, I think you're right. Especially coming at this as a non-believer, I'm thinking, of course the greatest danger comes from him. And it's easy to feel that because he's frustrated. Because these plebes do not understand how much work this is. And you can tell them and tell them and tell them. And they say, yeah, yeah, I got it. And then they lie to you again. And so his frustration index is through the roof already. But going back to that thing that we were saying about how this isn't like anything we've ever seen in the movies before. They go so much more into ritual and in a different way than anything I've ever seen before. Now, do you think that hesitance in other movies to delve that deeply into this is that focus groups would tell them that this is too boring. It's not interesting. It's not action packed enough. Quite possibly, or the people don't want to put the work in to cross every T and dot every I and come up with this thing that is nearly so unbelievable that we can't really imagine that it's based on some historical fact. I mean, who comes up with the idea of summoning your guardian angel? That goes back to at least the 15th century, but I'll get to that. When I say this is ritual, I mean it is almost all ritual. I would say 80% of the film is devoted to the accurate portrayal of what you must go through to do this. And even as an unbeliever, I can really see where all these arcane symbols and mumbo-jumbo is attractive, especially when the amount of time spent and the detail involved, it leads you to a very specific verisimilitude. It's putting order into something chaotic. It's making math do its work. I can hear horror fans falling asleep already. Yeah, right. I love the specific touches of the rooms that you go in to stop yourself going mad and the room to go in to grow steel. I kind of wish those existed. I probably need those many days. Now, you know, you can take what I say with a grain of salt, obviously. I come to this absolutely not as an occultist. 
We all bring our areas of expertise to a film, and Liam Gavin, who has at least dabbled in those things in his youth, he said that his strategy was to imply much more than explicitly show, which I think is always a smart way to go. I think the genius, though, is that the work is still there. You know that it is. You know that it's not just smoke and mirrors. It does make me wonder, though, how it feels to someone who is very well versed in these arcane arts. I wonder if it's the same thing as when I look at someone clearly playing the drums or guitar out of sync with the music they're supposed to be playing. It's probably a smaller audience out there that's <laughs> more in tune with the arcane rituals. Well, from all I could find, this all seems to be based upon a very real and specific ritual for communicating with your guardian angel. The Abramelin operation is what it's called. The original text of that, it dates back to 1458. And as originally outlined, it is elaborate and rigorous and potentially takes up to 18 months to complete. This is obviously a very quick thumbnail sketch I'm doing here of this. But the precision and the hand-drawn sigils and the austerity of the whole thing, they are all very accurately portrayed. And the thing that struck me most before I even knew these things, doing this research, that now has added significance is what I was just saying before. How instinctively that I felt any slight setback is catastrophic and made me imagine an infinite number of horrible outcomes spiraling out from that point. Irretrievable. It makes me think that every lie, every half-truth, every false start potentially ruins all of this in ways that you can't even imagine until it's too late and you get there and can't turn back. Now I understand why you get so angry with me if I try to use self-rising flour instead of all-purpose <laughs> flour. It all makes sense. Seriously, though, we've got to talk sometime about how your anti-authoritarian streak even goes as far as, I'm not going to follow this recipe. No, it's experimentation. <laughs> anyway... I'm so caught up in this idea of trying to master the circles, how much time that takes in this ritual. The thing I think I appreciate most of all that is that they seem to derive all of these rites from multiple cultures. I think that's really interesting. They invoke an appeal to deities from across the globe. We have mentions of Gnosticism, the Kabbalah, for example. Yeah, I really appreciate it because it reflects to me the universality and humanness of the altered states and very specific knowledge of yourself, especially, that you arrive at through endurance and deprivation and sacrifice. Every culture I can think of has religion and or science devoted to exploring that idea. And the rigor required of our protagonist here, it works on a meta level for me because it makes other movies that deal with this sort of thing seem lazy in terms of their commitment to their central conceits. As we go along, we discover she's resistant to only one idea. There is one line that she will not cross. She says, I don't do forgiveness. How did that play for you? Like it was written for me. <laughs> I have an entire speech worked out in my head about forgiveness. Should I ever have to give a victim impact statement in court? Well, maybe you're not the one to do this ritual then, because it is very definitely a requirement. He does figure a way around. Blood sacrifice is required to skip this step. But this is the one moment for me that's written a little thin. They telegraph the ending a bit by making this so emphatic and memorable right here. A little subtlety would have gone a long way here to a stronger payoff for me at the end. I disagree to an extent because of way back in the beginning when she is parsing out the information about what her actual real motive is, and she talks about the thing being her fault. So I think it does pay off as we go. Maybe I'll have to go back and watch it again then. But for me, it's a little on the nose right there, considering what happens at the end. And it's weird because other elements of the film that could be construed as too on the nose don't affect me that way. Their names are a perfect example of this. She's Sophia, Greek for wisdom. His surname is Solomon. Somewhat uncommon and impossible to not think of everything that connotes. And then his first name is Joseph. But when I thought about it as it was going, that didn't seem like too much at all. I rarely gave it a thought beyond it registering that, hey, there's another layer. It's true, and they so rarely refer to each other by name, it doesn't constantly come up. Now, around this point in the film... 
we discover that she has a picture of herself with her son and she tears herself out of that picture. And I don't know how you felt about it, but to me, it really conveyed how monumental this amount of self-loathing that she has. She's a very unapproachable character, unlikable. And I think almost everything of that stems from how she feels about herself. I disagree with the characterization of unlikable. I think unapproachable is absolutely the okay. way to put it. Well, she's been less than forthcoming, obviously, so far in a couple of instances. And this act with the photo, it makes me just a little slightly more suspicious than I was before about her involvement in what happened to her son, or at least how she feels responsible for it. I definitely formulated wild theories throughout the film, and one of those at the beginning was, gosh, did she have something to do with this? Well, what about him? Do you believe his spiel about all the things he's seen in pursuit of this knowledge? I don't believe a word of any of it, in the same way that I wouldn't believe a teenager expressing these same kinds of ideas. If he had confessed at some point that he took correspondence courses to learn this information, I would have believed that. I do, however, think that he believes what he's talking about, at least to the point of he's created this myth or idea about himself. I think that sort of syncs up with what I think about him. I believe that he lies constantly, but he does it as a way to get to the truth, if that makes sense. It's the same idea that he brings up later that if you do magic, you have to do black magic. You can't think of it from a traditional moral viewpoint. It's just to be complete. It's not about being nice or good. It's the pursuit of knowledge above all, and it doesn't neatly slot into your traditional Judeo-Christian good-evil binary. You know, when you said that, I think that's why I was rebelling against a little bit of that idea that she's unlikable, because having to have this idea of somehow being nice is not a thing that has to apply to her character. She can exist and be everything that she is, and likability doesn't have to enter into it. It's a good time to bring that up, because as they're having this discussion, it's also quite the giveaway that their conversation about all of this, her instinct defaults to interpreting all of this as power, not knowledge. A huge difference. Now, I did ask earlier about the danger that you perceive with all this, and I may be betraying my biases as a skeptic here, but I do feel this. There's always the edge of manipulation and room left for lingering doubt that he's just putting us on with all of this. Is that just me? I don't think so. The motive of money is not a small one. And he sets up at the beginning the understanding that sex is a part of this ritual. She agrees to that. She agrees to that, but she cannot agree to forgive, which I think is one of those things where I appreciate how they veer away from the Judeo-Christian good-evil binary. It's just part of what has to be done. There's no moral judgment about it. Exactly. And something that you don't see in a lot of other films as well, removing the emotion from certain things and how that can be difficult for some people. And then they get to the moment where the sex part is supposed to take place. But instead, he masturbates. He forces her to undress and essentially perform for him, look a certain way for him, but there's no sex. And there's no sex part of the ritual, period. It's not that he has twisted it to his own ends. It doesn't exist as far as this particular rite goes. So he's tricked her into exposing herself. And it's a convenient line here that she stays pure, he doesn't have to, but this is an incredible violation, it feels like. It does, and he knows it. He can't face her. Is it the biggest violation? Because there are also a few that happen. Because he could have been lying about anything the entire time. His past, what he's done, what he's accomplished. He could have been setting her up from the start. And if you think about it, there's no way that a salt circle could possibly survive 18 months. And then the idea that he may have been part of her son's abduction and murder. I think there's no ritual that is taking things too far for her. Obviously, based upon what we see here and what she continues to go along with, the things that she survives and stays, although in the wake of this breach of trust, she is ready to quit. But it's mostly because it's not working. It's not because of what he's done to her. How much of a factor is 
that violation then? Is it more important to her that they are getting a result? I definitely think so. He says it's a cycle. I point to that cycle of abusive behavior again. Is it a metaphor for that? And there's also a case to be made, I think, that the ritual she's going through closely reflects the five stages of grief. Oh my gosh, you stole from my notes. <laughs> Same thing that I wrote down when you talk about trust and belief and grief and anger, all of those things. Well, the thing that keeps her hanging on, I think, she does soon get a glimpse of the type of result that she's seeking. First, we have a little bit of a touch of nature encroaching on their sealed environment, and then the scene where gold leaf is floating in the air. This is the first sort of manifestation that can't be waved off as coincidence. If you accept that this is happening, then you also can no longer doubt his credentials. And there was never a point at which I thought it was only in her imagination. Did you ever think that? Well, I did wonder, because if we talk about the arduousness of this ritual, part of you has to wonder, am I truly just hallucinating from simply organic reasons? Can you truly trust what it is you're seeing? And there are times when it's just her seeing something and then not. So I feel like that's on purpose. We can't quite hang on to anything until the end. Well, as a viewer, not as a participant, let's say, the way the supernatural elements were introduced, was it believable for you? Absolutely. I think it enhanced and raised the tension every single time. My favorite instance, I don't know about yours, the invisible thing smoking in the that's chair. That's a pretty good one. Yeah, I feel that way about it, too. It never knocked the rhythm off or the crucial naturalness of the whole thing. I didn't feel like there were any cheap tricks along the way. The thing that might have undermined whether or not I believed what she was seeing on my end, she seems like the type that is never going to see everything. She's not built for acceptance. It may be that she's trying too hard. She's impatient. She's dishonest. She's not a good vessel. And I can really relate to that. I could be a character like this, too much of a skeptic. I can never be a true believer, no matter what the motivation. And on top of everything else, we also discover another layer of her deceit. What she actually wants is revenge when it comes down to it. Her son actually died at the hands of others doing a ritual. How can she not see the severity of the consequences of doing this wrong? Because I think she has another motive. Yet again. Yes. I think she's been pulling the strings all along. Well, one of my favorite lines of dialogue that actually directly addresses that comes up right here. He tells her, I don't need you to be virtuous. I need you to be driven. And while it may not rip the covers back from whatever she's doing, I think it really exposes the silly way that we as an audience often think of virtue as only reflecting traditionally positive manifestations. You can be honest and still say terrible things. Right, that purity and virtue are not the same. Yeah, exactly. And I definitely understand his frustration in her not grasping that you need to tell the truth, not just what you think is palatable. You have to be steadfast and true, not, yeah, yeah, I got it. But you say she's up to even more than that. I do. Do you want to get into it here? Before we do, before you pull that curtain back, I want to ask you a question about, did you ever waver between, I hope this works and I hope it doesn't? And if you did, what made you choose? I really didn't. I ultimately hoped it was going to work, really honestly, just for a satisfying cinematic experience, if nothing else. I wanted there to be some concrete resolution in her son's death. And I was hoping that this would end up being real in terms of the ritual. I didn't want the ending to have been months of a lie for some sick purpose of his. But a sick purpose of hers, no problem. Absolutely. <laughs> I didn't want the rug to be pulled out from under me in a very specific way. You don't feel that way, though, the rug being pulled out from under you as we slowly discover she's working two angles here, not just the ritual, but trying to achieve something else. Yes, at least I think so. As he finds this out, though, little by little, it does require constant adjustment of what they're doing. Let's talk about this bathtub scene for a second. This put a huge knot in my stomach. 
Certainly. Once again, he's appealing to multiple deities. There's a baptism of sorts, a way of her becoming anew. He holds her under the water, then performs these incantations and literally kills her for a moment. Yeah, starting out as a baptism, but it's a resurrection. Did you doubt that she was going to come back? Did you wonder, is he going to kill her right now? Well, he does, essentially, and she does still come back, and I was expecting that not to be the end. Too much time on the old VCR counter? Right. Well, she is truly new now, having been momentarily dead, and this is an extremely risky ritual. It should indicate to her the severity of her transgression. And then little things begin to echo larger. Everything is becoming more dangerous, more intense. In the beginning, when she's less than fully honest, for example, about speaking German, he cuts his hand slightly, attributing that to being her fault. Or we should say his hand is cut. But it's been established along the way here that if she botches it, he's the one that physically bears the brunt. So now he falls on a knife in the kitchen. Infection sets in severely, but significantly he does not consider quitting. Which to me only goes to further the point that he believes very sincerely in all of this. The fear of crossing the salt circle. None of that is a put on, even if he does have slightly ulterior motives. That there still isn't yet a sense of finality. We haven't achieved the end result yet. So we get to the big question that we've been dancing around a little bit. For me, at least. Is he, do you think, a participant in her child's death? She says it was teenagers. I definitely think so. And I think this is why the film bears multiple viewings as well. The way that he asked that question of her, you don't think I had something to do with it. It's way too specific at that moment. It wouldn't be asked otherwise. It wouldn't come up otherwise. And so if we go back to the beginning, when she is answering his questions about what her motives are, standing at the sink, The way she stops herself from looking at him, her apprehension and her reticence, I think it's because she knows if she reveals all too early, he would leave. And ultimately, the proof is in the pudding. Solomon (laughs) promises her she would get vengeance, and she does. I laugh because I was on the fence until she found her son's photo covered in his vomit. So proof in the pudding, I think it's kind of funny that you say that. (laughs) That's also how I feel about pudding. But I moved over into the yes column after that. But I do like, like you say, you could read the film in a way that leaves you saying no or undecided. Absolutely. I could be the one watching it again and think, oh, maybe I saw that differently the first time and I have a different view of it now. Well, I love how this leads into my favorite scene, the one that we did for our opening scene. I love the writing here, as opposed to the other scene that I felt was too on the nose. I think the writing here, when they're discussing this, it understands the characters so well. He's trying to explain to her that if you do this and it works, you could ask for so much more, but her pain limits her imagination. And depending on how you read it, nothing else is even necessary. There's only one goal. Also, it makes me wonder, I'm toying with a little bit of fan fiction here, was she dead the entire time? (laughs) Did you have a particular favorite scene as we go along here? I am crazy about that scene when she meets her sister way Mm -hmm. early on, and there's just no ability for her sister to understand. That makes Sophia unlike any other character that we see generally. The position that she's in, what's motivating her, what's driving her, whether she's dead or not, metaphorically or in real life. For the record, I do not think she is dead the entire time. Okay, that's fair. I do like nice little touches along the way, though, that also indicate to us where she is mentally, emotionally. You recognize pieces of clothing being recycled in one outfit in particular. The second time she wakes up wearing those clothes, it's very memorable. She's oriented the opposite direction of the way she was laying the first time we see her wearing that outfit. She's become a completely different person now that she's gone through all of this. Another huge Benefit to me is something like you're talking about with meeting the sister. I think it figures into almost everything in this. The little figure that keeps turning up. It has some common horror elements, but almost always it doesn't deploy them the same way as a normal horror film would. Just like our discussion of 
complex versus unlikable. That's why I'm drawn to this character. It's not made easy for us, and we expect something different, usually from a woman, and it's not played that way. We come to another example of those horror tropes that I think is used very well here, very smartly. She speaks to a voice purporting to be her son through the door, and it's particularly tempting and heartbreaking when he asks her, where are we? She recognizes it as a trick, though, and she denies him entry, which is the right move. Since you bring up the likable thing here, there are brief, and I do mean very brief, moments where we feel sorry for Solomon, I think. His bluster is necessary and a sham all at once. When he says this thing about demons fear me, I very definitely hear that juvenile thing that you were talking about. It's both a boast, but it's also a matter of fact due to his pursuit of his knowledge. Do you feel that too for him, that sympathy once in a while? I do. I actually feel it for both of them for different reasons in the non-sex scene. I was going to ask about her too. We mentioned how unsympathetic she can be. I think if I feel that way, if I don't give her as much sympathy as I would him, I do that solely because I think she doesn't need it the way he does. She's not asking for it. She wouldn't accept it. And based on how you read the two of them and you see what they go through together, how do you perceive the movement of their relationship? Is it peaks and valleys? It starts out wrong and then only deteriorates? Is it something else? What do you see there? I think it's interesting that guilt and shame are at both of their core, but in a different way and manifests in a different way. So her answer was probably Catholic in the beginning? Probably. And I'm fascinated by this dynamic, even though there is a partnership, that they have to work together. They exist wholly separate at the same time. It wasn't what I was expecting. I also wasn't expecting that they don't grow closer at any point. I think that would be so cheap. I think that maintenance of their independence is a huge factor in how this film is successful. It especially underlines for me how fearless that she is in pursuit of this vengeance. Like I said, she doesn't need anything from anyone. The example of her approaching that smoking figure in the chair is a good example for me that even though this is terribly frightening, nothing is going to stop me. Nothing that would be traditionally frightening affects her the same way now, I think, because she suffered the worst thing that you could imagine, the loss of her child. How is anything else going to hurt you after that? She's completely consumed by her grief and nothing else can touch her. She's so fearless that eventually she crosses over the line. She breaks that protective circle. And then she finds herself traversing that opening landscape, but on foot now. But she can't escape. She returns to the house and she watches as Solomon is dragged off and then encounters the spirits in the house. And these demons, they take her finger, so we have an echo of that original blood sacrifice. It becomes very chaotic, and we feel like we are teetering on the brink here. Until we have this moment of ascension. Now, ascension, moving into the light, all of these cliches, typically in horror films, that connotes death to me. You mentioned Poltergeist, that's a perfect example. In this case, though, She's being raised from the pit. Her guardian angel is coming to rescue her at the last minute. Or if not to rescue, to answer. And like I said, I was still sort of questioning whether she had been dead the whole time or stay dead after drowning. I read it here as moving up from hell through purgatory into heaven. Is that why we've never looked at a house with a finished basement? Purgatory, is that what you consider that? <laughs> no, under that would be purgatory. Or just roaming around this neighborhood sometimes. But even if it's not a realm that she's going to stay in, I do still read it as heaven. Let's talk a little bit about that. The implications of mythologies and religious traditions that depict angels as warriors with the armor, the weapons. As a non-believer, I am coming at this from the angle that I am fascinated by human nature and the symbols that we develop as a culture for the parts of our nature that we are uncomfortable with or events that we can't explain. The movie, though, it obviously takes that approach that these things are real, not metaphor. So if I'm going to approach the film on its own terms, I have to take that into account. So then what makes it most interesting, given that it acknowledges that these forces are out there, is that we also somehow think that it is possible 
to occasionally bend these forces to our will and do these dark errands for us. That we're able to pierce the veil sometimes, that we're able to actually get answers to these questions, to gain knowledge, which is what Solomon said the whole point of everything was anyway. I just love the touch, again, when I'm referencing going through these circles, when she has had her finger cut off and to stop the bleeding, she covers her hand and that turns into a prayer pose just seamlessly. Now, my inclinations don't usually go there. We don't often cover religious films. In its own way, is this the most spiritual film that we've ever done on the show? Maybe Andrei Rublev, I guess. Ah, right. Good point with that. Definitely, the guardian angel is not a concept I've seen in another film that I can think of. And when I say Andrei Rublev, I do make a distinction here with that, too. I think of that as definitely a religious film, but grounded in the philosophical, not in the metaphysical. Mainly, I should say. Yeah, we're really selling tickets over here. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) well, let's get to the guardian angel scene, since you brought it up. I really like this scene. I know some people have questioned the effects, and it's kind of a surprising left turn they take here. But it pays off for me. Like you were mentioning earlier, these little things happen where it works to establish a whole. She's seeing the architecture. And faced with this figure, she finally wants the power to forgive. This is her transformation. But is it truly redemptive, or is this a little hollow? What do you think? I'm not sure about either of those, but I do think it's a transformation. Knowledge is what I think she's gained. When she sees that car pass her, she knows she's moved beyond something, passed through some state into another state. The whole point is to know she's seen the architecture like you mentioned. And when we go again back to the beginning, I want to talk about how I do think those moments have paid off, saying that it was her fault that she doesn't do forgiveness. And then that voice who is not her son, Jack, asks, are you asking me to forgive you? She can't answer it at that moment, and she can later. And if her ultimate wish is to be able to forgive not herself, but him, if we accept that he did have a part to play in the murder, that's transformative. Yeah, that's the wrench I was just about to throw in the works here. If you believe that Solomon was at least partially responsible for her son's death and is now dead himself, she no longer needs to ask for revenge. So maybe it's not the transformation we think it is. That is sated, and now she can move on to forgiveness, perhaps for herself. So if that's the case, is this truly transformative, or is it that one obstacle is removed and now we can move to the next step on the list? Interesting. Well, she doesn't desecrate his body. She sends it flowing down the river, which is definitely rooted in some sort of religious service. So I'm going to stick with transformation. You can't move me off of that point. Just kidding. Maybe you can. Well, I will admit, the first time I saw this, as she was driving away at the end, something about her didn't sit right with me. Not that the story had cheated, but that she had cheated somehow, if only again by withholding up until the very last moment. Or playing the double game. It's so beautifully complicated and it leaves you so unsettled. It's the exact opposite, for instance, of how I felt about something like the finale of the first season of True Detective. That felt cheap and unearned and like a complete sellout to me. But in this case, regardless of what you think of Solomon's possible complicity in her son's death, this does not feel like that. Like I said, the rug doesn't get pulled out from under us in a crappy way. Yeah, either way... I understand her epiphany and being unable to ask for anything else in the face of what she has survived and the being that stands before her. It achieves the effect for me of good old-fashioned awe. And when I say awe, I mean biblical style awe. But can you imagine her standing in front of that figure and saying, avenge my son's death? How terrifying that would be. And it should be noted, I think, that his request was granted As well, he got his invisibility and peace, albeit in a very monkey's paw, be careful what you wish for kind of way. So how did you feel once all was said and done? A good Colleen kickoff here? Absolutely. I'm both happy and sorry that it took me this long to get to it, but I'm so glad I finally got to watch it. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. It's ultimately a very realistic, humane treatment of using magic to address these desires and how ritual 
prepares you and changes you. It was disruptive that she wasn't honest about her aims, obviously, but that really only mainly affected the preparations that he made and the way he directed things. She still learned what she learned as a result of the journey and maybe was even taken by surprise by her ultimate desire for forgiveness, both giving and receiving. Mainly, I just love it because the film falls squarely in line with my belief that humans are imperfect vessels for this, for anything, but we do our best. What about you? Do you have something that falls squarely in line with your philosophy to recommend? I have something that falls squarely in the whole rituals or really difficult things philosophy, and that is Requiem from 2006, directed by Hans Christian Schmidt with Sandra Hewler, Bergert Klausner, and Imogen Koga. It's the story of a young woman enrolled at a religious university who is struggling with her strict upbringing and this newfound freedom. She also has debilitating epilepsy, which is completely denied in principle by her parents. I just want to say this is a great choice, actually, to compliment this film, and scary, too. It actually really has frightening things happening in it. It does. It's reframed this epilepsy as a possible demonic possession, and so she begins a brutal regime of exorcism in order to be cured. The worst part, it's based on a true story. That real-life person was Annalisa Michel, a 23-year-old student who died in 1976 from starvation as a result of this exorcism process. If you want to look up her story, it's terrible and the rug does get pulled out from under you. Sandra Hewler here is extraordinary, and as an actress has only become better, and spoiler alert, we'll be talking about Tony Erdmann next year. So how about you? For my recommendation, I chose Starry Eyes from 2014, and that's directed by Kevin Kolsch and Dennis Widmeyer, and it stars Alexandra Esso, Amanda Fuller, Noah Sagan, and genre stalwart Pat Healy. It's about a struggling actress that enters into an arrangement with a shadowy cabal in pursuit of fame and stardom. And I choose this as a companion because it's also a moody examination of how much people are willing to sacrifice to get the thing they want most in the world. It's a nice middle point between the austerity and artiness of a dark song and then some of the better but more traditional contemporary horror films. It's kind of right in between. It definitely follows a more familiar Faustian template in the way the story unfolds, and it has more scares and gore of the type that you might expect, but I don't mean that as a negative. Those things are time-tested, and they work for a reason. The way they use them here is great, and I really enjoy the self-reflexive shots that it takes at the entertainment industry and what might be behind that curtain. If you don't quite want to go as far as to seal yourself off from the world to do a ritual for 18 months, Try this one first and edge your way toward that more esoteric. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Requiem and Starry Eyes. And that brings us to the end of episode 141. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. Throughout the month of October, I will also be posting Edgar Allan Poe short stories that I'm reading as a thank you every Friday. A special thank you goes out this time to our friend Spencer Seams at the We Cut Heads podcast. He recently had us on for a really fun conversation about the classic Egyptian film Cairo Station. So please go check that out along with Spencer's other episodes. If you're a Spike Lee fan, there is a whole lot to dig into right there. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. The fine gentleman at FUDS on Film, Mike Scharf, Laura Cannon and the Fatal Films Podcast, Matthias Larson, Josh Hornbeck and the Criterion Channel Surfing Podcast, and Andy Wolverton. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. As of this week, you can now find our show on Amazon Music. That's a new development for us recently. In addition to that, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, 
Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to leave us a rating or a review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>